poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. And today's guest on CPG is Tom Donkey Bomber Schneider. Tom is a man of many talents, and among those talents are singing, songwriting, entrepreneurship, C-suite businessman, writing books, and public speaking. But in the world of poker, he's primarily battled in high-stakes live cash games over the decades, while also dabbling in MTTs and racking up over $2.3 million in lifetime caches, while also snagging the WSOP Player of the Year. Simply put, the man's a quintessential high performer and a treasure trove of hilarious poker stories and wisdom. So in today's episode with the Donkey Bomber, you're going to learn why believing you're always playing your best has serious consequences in your poker career, the hilarious story behind Tom's Donkey Bomber nickname, why you should trust those bad feelings in your gut in the middle of your poker sessions, and much, much more. Now, without any further ado, it's my honor and privilege to bring to you a legend in the world of poker, the one and only Tom Donkey Bomber Schneider. Tom Schneider, welcome to Chasing Poker Greatness, sir. How you doing, man? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Um, yeah, so Donkey Bomber here with the Donkey Bomber. I guess the, the, we'll start there. Where where did Donkey Bomber come from? So uh, I was playing high stakes cash games and doing fairly well, and um, the people that I was playing with, I was beating, but they were winning tournaments. So I decided to start playing uh, poker tournaments. So I went to Reno, my first, you know, kind of major tournament. It was a $5,000 entry. And um, I had been playing with a guy uh, who was the previous, his name's Arnold Spee. He was the previous winner of the tournament the prior year. So he won a million dollars at Reno. And uh, I was at his table and and he literally started ripping into me. Uh, he was calling me a donkey. He was saying, you're so stupid. You you don't know what you're doing. I you know, he said, you're not going to make a past dinner break. And I go, good, because I'm hungry. You know, I literally, <laughs> I don't get phased by those kind of comments. I literally just agree. Like I am, I know, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I appreciate, you know, your counsel. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing. I'm a, I'm a smart ass back, but they don't know if I'm being a smart ass. I'm really serious. Right. And so, um, so he called me, he, he, he said so many things to me about being a donkey and stupid and so on that another player at the table said, call the floor. This is ridiculous. Right. And to me, it wasn't bothering me. Right. It was kind of, I beat him out of every hand. Right. And so it was really kind of fun to, um, to, to, you know, to beat him out of every hand and have him continue to call me names. I'm happy with that. Actually, that's kind of the way I view poker. Uh, and, and so, um, I made it to the final table. It was my first, you know, major event. I made it to the final table. And they asked me what my nickname was. And I said, well, according to Arnold Spee, it's, I'm, my nickname is Donkey, right? And so at the time, I don't wear sunglasses ever, but I did that time. It was my first time on TV. And I'm like, I don't know. Everybody else is wearing sunglasses. I'll wear them. <laughs> and I had a, you know, I'm bald. So I had a hoodie on. And, and Vince Van Patten goes, you know, he looks like he's a, he's a Unabomber wannabe. But I think he's the Donkey Bomber. So that's how it started, but it was really <laughs> thanks to Arnold Spee. I have kind of a funny nickname. That's it a great stuck story. for some reason. It really stuck. I mean, people started calling me that, which is kind of weird. Well, it, it sticks in the brain, Donkey Bomber. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's not gonna not gonna fall out of my my mind anytime soon. Yeah, um, it, you know, you mentioned you you were playing high stakes cash typically, and so let's talk about your journey. You know, into yeah. the world world of poker and games in general. Um, what does your journey through the world of cards look like? So my family, we, when, when they had my parents, when they had friends over, they would drink and, and play cards and they weren't playing for a lot of money. But for me as a kid, it was a lot of money. 
And instead of going off and playing with the other kids, even at like five and six years old, I'm like, I, I want to play, you know, and I was, I wanted to win. And, uh, you know, I might win five or 10 bucks or something. And to them, it was no big deal. But to me, I'm going to play my very best. And people did stupid stuff and they played games like spit or, you know, like Buckham and games that, you know, they, these people just wanted to gamble because they thought it was fun and I wanted to win. So I won money as a, even a, you know, young kid. And then, well, my favorite story is my, my mom was, uh, taking photography classes and I was, 12 years old and I had a two year old daughter and she paid me $5 a day to babysit. So I would babysit, make $5 a day. And I'd ask Whoa. my friends over. You said daughter, sister, sister, <laughs> sister. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was like, you were 12 my, and I had a two year old yeah, daughter. Yeah, wow. yeah, exactly. No, I'm sorry. My sister, yeah. my sister, she seemed like my daughter. Cause you know, it was 10 years different and uh, no, she was my daughter, my sister. Sorry. Uh, and my mom would pay me to babysit her while she took photography classes, $5 a day. So I'd call my buddies over and say, Hey, come on over, let's play poker. And I had $5 to play with. And, you know, I had beat amount of money and, uh, my, I didn't do a good job of babysitting my sister, but I did do a good job of beating my friends out of their money. And I was just, you know, I was a consistent winner in the game. I just won all the time. And I, for some reason, thought about the game differently than they did. What, and I understood the concept of outs and things fairly early. Yeah. Uh, what year was this to sort of set the timeline? Uh, well, I'm 62, so let's call it 50 years ago. I can't even do the math. Uh, so like yeah, this late 70s, ago. late 70s, something like that. Uh, yeah, whatever 50 years ago is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, late, early, yeah 70s, 70, early, early 70s. Early 70s. Yeah. yeah, yeah early, early 70s. 70s yeah. Early seventies. Yeah. And so I would play poker and, you know, I would play gin with my dad at the country club, even as a young, you know, 13, 14 year old kid, I would play gin with my dad after golf and I would beat the old guys <laughs> playing gin. And uh, I just, it just was something that came very naturally to me. And I, I wasn't emotional about uh, cards, which a lot of people make very emotional decisions and i was always pretty unemotional about cars and always wanting to make good decisions and it started fairly early yeah can you describe how you thought about the game differently back then or just how you thought about you know you mentioned that uh you wanted to win so you know there's a path to winning and a path to losing right so like what did your path to winning look like um when you weren't playing cards so when I wasn't playing cards and winning, I was uh, the quarterback of my high school team. I was the uh, pitcher. I was the, the captain of my football and baseball team, and I played basketball as well. And so I was very athletic. So, um, you know, I, I was just very competitive in all things, but not in a – I've never been a fist pumper or, a, you know, any of those kind of things. It's more of a I just want to try my best. And, and if yeah. I give my all on every play and I – and I think through things as, as best I can, then I feel like I've won. Right. And, yeah. and that's kind of how I viewed, have viewed, you know, being competitive. I, I was uh, more speaking to sort of how you thought about poker when you weren't playing poker, you know, how you thought about cards, how, how you oh. trained or, you know, just kind of taught yourself to think about the game so that when you did play, you would have an edge. So as I got, as I got older, it's kind of funny. My sister, uh, bought me Super System, uh, Doyle Brunson's book. It was a $50 book at the time, you know, and I was like, it was 1978 and that was a ridiculous amount of money to pay for a book. I was already a winning player, but I wasn't a confident winning player of knowing kind of what I should do and how I should do it. I mean, I, I thought what I should do, but it was more or less, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, approaching like uh, successive approximations, right? You do this and that's wrong. You do this and that's wrong. You kind of gradually move towards the center where the best play is, right? And so, uh, but I read that book and then I started thinking like, well, I want to play better than this book, even though, you know, Doyle at the time was uh, an amazing, one of the best players in the world. But I actually, you know, was just destroying games um, because I was, I was played differently than everybody else. I thought about the game more aggressively because people played so tight back in, in, you know, when I first started playing, they literally would fold really big hands and you could bluff in limit poker back then. It was amazing. Uh, now there's so little bluffing, right? You, you typically show down a hand in limit poker, 
But back then, I mean, people would would just uh, make an assumption that if you raised, you you had them beat, right? So I was so aggressive, and um, I thought about the game in a lot of different ways. One is is that the people sitting at the table are your customers, and I never talked about poker. And so there were two or three players. You know, there was a guy named Mike Wattell, who's a famous poker player. He was in the game, but he and I and and one or two other guys knew that we were the pros in the game or the winners in the game. And we never talked about about poker. We never, you know, it was always about making the environment fun. So one, I thought about making the environment fun for my customers, right? And I think that's a that's something that's a lost art is is making people want to. I, I have people say I enjoy losing to you, and I'm like, thank you. That's that's a, a huge compliment, right? Because that's exactly what I want is people to enjoy losing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would th- sit and think about, you know, a lot of it was at the table, so. I learned a lot about tells watching my own feelings, right? About when I put chips in and how did I, why did I just retract my hand so quickly when I, when I did that, that was weird. And, you know, I would try to feel my way around myself and go, how, why am I, why am I behaving the way I'm behaving? And I believe that other people are going to behave similarly. So I literally, would pay attention to the way I put chips in and the way I moved and the way I moved away from the table and, and toward the table and all of those things at a very early, you know, when I was in my twenties, I would think about the game that way from a, from a tell perspective. Um, it seems like a lot of learning through failure, right? Like oh yeah. when, when something yeah. goes wrong, there's this self reflective process of like, what went wrong? What can I do better in the future? Um, applying that to not only, you know, your opponents, but also to yourself that sort of allowed you to regularly make upgrades at ver- in various, you know, um, different areas of your game. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, it's things like playing, you know, uh, in a, in a, you know, raised pot back then, if somebody raises an early position and you play an ace three, you know, you get your head pounded in enough with a bad kicker and you kind of, you know, you kind of realize that that's a, you know, and I came up with kind of a different theory about like ace bad kicker is that when there's an ace on the board and you have a bad kicker, you're either going to lose, uh, you know, to someone with a better kicker or you're not going to make any money because an ace scares everybody away, you know, which I think is actually a little bit more important than the losing with a, a you know, worse kicker because you can kind of play accordingly, but you literally aren't going to make any money if no one else has an ace, you know, unless uh, they flop, you know, you know, you don't get away from it. And I, I just learned a lot of that stuff by, I would just sit and think about the game. I would just think about it and go, you know, uh, it, it, cause I just, I had this real yearning to win and not even so much about the money, but I just love winning, you know, I'm very competitive and I just don't like losing. Yeah. And you, you mentioned, uh, treat the other players like your customers, which sort of, uh, blends in, you know, business, which is the yeah. other, you know, your other path. Um, tell me like about your business career and then how poker, uh, you know, just how, how poker was woven into your, your business career during your twenties and thirties. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I ended up becoming a CPA, but I'm not a traditional CPA where I'm doing taxes and things like that. I was a controller for ping golf. $300 million company with, you know, 1,500 employees. I was a CFO for a public company. I was a president of a public company. I'm now a CFO for a private equity owned company. And so um, I have always used numbers as part of uh, kind of who I am and how I apply mathematics to decisions where a lot of people don't think about the mathematics of business. And I think the mathematics of business are are very similar to the mathematics of poker. And a lot of people don't, don't realize that or apply them. In and what so, way, in what way are they similar? Uh, well, I mean, you're, you're literally thinking about pot odds, right? When you're making a decision, sometimes you've invested in some sort of a, of a advertising campaign or a, uh, you know, in, a, in an asset, you're looking at, 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 at acquiring some sort of fixed asset and you want to understand really what that's going to do for you and the investment that you're going to make and then and the net present value or the internal rate of return on on that asset and see whether it's really a valuable purchase you know and then you rank you know you rank the assets or the investments that you're uh attempting you know you're you're going to make and then what you 
what you, what I do is I look at things like from a expected value standpoint, which a lot of people don't use in business, right? So there's different expected values for a scenario, right? And they should add up to 100%. And then you can determine whether whether that investment actually has a positive expected value. And a lot of people don't don't look at things that way. Yeah, it makes sense. It's uh, like a lot of risk analysis, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I listen, I've, I've been turned down for jobs because I was a poker player. Really? Yeah, I have ah. been turned down for jobs. And, and you know, people How who does don't- How that happen? People who don't play- Well, so as a financial officer, right, you have control of the money. That scares people. Everyone has an uncle who, you know, went to the racetrack <laughs> and lost all of their- you know, lost the house or, you know, they had to take their family in because the the douchebag lost all their money. And they equate those two things to being a really good professional poker player. And those aren't, obviously, you and I know those aren't the same, but to them they are because they don't gamble on anything. Right. And um, I try to, you know, I had, I had the uh, chief operating officer come to me when I was at Ping. He said, I hear you're a gambler. And I said, "Uh, no. I said, I, I play poker. And he goes, well, isn't that gambling? I said, well, the way I look at it is, you know, like if you owned a casino and you have a house edge over all of the players, you, you can almost predict your, you know, casinos can, other than the economy, if the economy stays the same, casinos can predict, predict their revenue better than most other companies, right? Because they know their house edge on all the games. They know which games people are going to play. And so they can predict their revenue pretty, pretty, uh, uh, you know, unless some whale comes in and, and does some damage, but typically it's, it's an easy thing because you have a consistent edge. Right. And so, um, uh, I have an edge over, you know, I explained that I have an edge over players and he goes, well, why do you think that? I go, well, what if you and I played poker? Do you think I would beat you? And he goes, well, yeah, I go, that's the whole point. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, and so if you, you know, it, you have to explain that to people who aren't, who are in business that don't gamble, kind of what, you know, what it means. And then I start talking to him about plays that I've made and things that I've done in poker where they're like, how did you do that? And I go, well, let me tell you how I did it. And here's why the thought process I went through when I made that decision. And then they go, oh, okay, this is different than what I thought it was. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, I, I always find it interesting that like that, that connection isn't made more quickly just because everything in life is risk. You know, there, there's risk with every single decision and especially in business as well. Like um, you do the best you can with the data points and the information you have, and then you place a bet and then hope that it works out. Right. Uh, right given right. given the information, they don't all work out. You know, you, no, they you, don't. you make a bad hire. Um, you place a bet that went south. Right. Right. Um, right. So, well, and that's, that's how I try to sell it when I'm, if I'm ever interviewing is that, you know, Poker and business are are so similar, and especially in one one area, it's it's the accumulation of great decisions over and over. You will be successful if you make great decisions over and over, and that doesn't mean the results will be positive. It just means the decisions are great. Yeah, and um, and people have trouble uh, divorcing those concepts, you know, results and decisions. Uh, but you know, you could you could decide to open up a business, and it's an amazing decision. And then a freeway comes in, and and it's totally out of your control. And then shifts all the customers to somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And so at the time, you made a great decision, and you had no other information. Um, uh, I, it's funny because I have people come up to me all the time, and they get knocked out of the tournament, and then I say, "I played so great, you know, I played the greatest poker I've ever played." And I go, "Really?" You know, and let's say I'm watching him, right? There was one case where I was watching him and I said, did you notice that when you were in the cutoff seat, that the, the two other people uh, to your left were going to fold their hand? Did you notice that? He goes, yeah, I had seven deuce. I go, I, I, did you notice that, right? And yeah. if you didn't notice that, if you weren't paying attention to that, you weren't, that's just one example of how you weren't playing the best poker you could possibly play. It might've been the best you you can play. But yeah. those are two different things, right? Right. And, um, you know, I've when I was at my very best, I had intense concentration. I mean, I noticed things that were unbelievable. Um, and I was, you know, I literally would mimic people's breathing when they were in a big pot, whether I was in it with them or not. I would mimic their breathing. So I would know what it would feel like to breathe like they're breathing when they had a big hand. Wow. Or when they had a, when they had a bad hand, right? 
And so I would literally sit there and breathe like they breathe because it's different than you and I breathe, right? You and I breathe differently no matter what situation. But if you're in a big situation and you watch someone's chest and see how, how high it goes out, listen to how long their breath is when how much they breathe in and breathe out. Uh, you, you can notice a lot of things. That's a big, that's just a, something that no one can control, right? Is their breathing, especially in a, in a high, high risk situation. So um, what did you learn from that uh, sort of experiment of like, just trying to breathe like other people breathe in the, in those spots? Uh, so I would, I would watch them um, when they're in a big hand, right? And it doesn't mean that I have to be in a big hand. So let's say that you're in a big hand and, and your breathing is super calm, right? It's, it's just, you know, that's, a, that's one way of breathing. Another way of breathing is, you know, and it, could, it means different things for different people. But if you can sit there and do that and notice that the guy turned over a huge hand, right? And he was breathing super calmly or he was breathing like that it's the, everybody does things differently right and that's why you want to corroborate what that's why it's so important to not pay attention to the cute waitress that's walking by it's so important when someone's in a big hand to do nothing but focus on on what they're going to turn over and how they behave while they're in the hand i i i had uh tells for checking i would count how long people would take to check when it was their turn I would count how many times they would tap the table. I would look and see whether their hand was open or closed. You know, all of those things. I literally would just just do nothing. And typically what you want to do is you want to focus on the bad players, right? Because of the ones that are going to give more tells. And I also wanted to focus on the people that were in more hands because I can get more opportunities to pick up tells on people who play a lot, even if they're good players. You know, I had one, I picked up a tell on Eric Seidel just by watching how he put his chips in a pot. So it's, it seems to me that the thing that, yeah, the skill that you love cultivating is discovering and prioritizing data points that, that may not be obvious to other people, right? In the instance mm -hmm. of like the cutoff and like, did you notice that the button in the small blind had like pre-folded already, right? In that case, um, the prioritization- They had pre-folded, but they gave pre-fold, they gave folding- folding tells, yeah, yeah. right? Right. Like yeah. they, that they were consistent with previous folding tells. Exactly. Right. right? So, yeah. so that, that's the priority in the decision-making there is that the, the two players on your left are most likely going to fold and it's not the absolute strength of your hand is the priority. Um, in that case, the absolute strength of your hand doesn't really matter so much given that we, we know these two guys have, or will most likely right. pre-fold. Um, right. And then all, the other, you know, the other things are, are paying attention to yeah, just hidden data points that are available, readily available to everybody else at the table. Yeah. Um, you're just trying to analyze them and weight them and then prioritize them and use them to make better decisions uh, right. in, in the future. One of my favorite things to do when I go to a World Series event is, you know, if you're going to play in an event with two or 3,000 people, it's likely that there's going to be six people, seven people that you've never seen before. And so, you know, I will make sure that I introduce myself to people and and talk to them. You know, I see a guy with a Nebraska shirt on. Are you, are you from Nebraska? Yeah, I am. I go, uh, how many events are you playing this year? He goes, oh, this is the only event. I go, are you, looks like you're married. How, what's your wife think about that, right? And he goes, ah, she's not happy that I'm here. I'm like, oh, okay. So guess what? Guess what that guy's motivation is? That guy's motivation is on the first break to be able to call his wife and go, honey, I'm still in. Here's my stack. Yeah, it doesn't want to on bust. The next, on the next break, I'm, I'm still in honey, right? Cause she's not happy that he's here. And so all he need, all he wants to do is make it through day one. That's it. And so now I know unless he's got a monster, I can push him around, which is something I'll do. Right. And he's already given me information that other people, uh, and you know, you talk, you talk to other people, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant. Okay. That's good to know. Typically accountants don't play like me, you know, they're, <laughs> they're pretty conservative, and, uh, you know, you get an idea of what they do, whether they're married, whether their wife likes them being there, and you've already gathered enough information to know who you want to play hands against, right? At least to start. Um, it's just things like that. And that's just things that I really, uh, when I was playing my best, when I really cared, uh, I think I was really good at that. Go going back to 
you know, you being in your twenties and playing poker, improving your skill, uh, wanting to play better than super system. What was that time in your life? What did your poker journey look like back then? You know, as you were like, like what stake were you playing? And then, you know, when you bought into the 5k tournament, you mentioned that you've been playing high stakes poker. So like what, what constituted high stakes poker, um, in that time? So I'll give you, I'll give you an idea. It's kind of a funny story. Uh, A buddy of mine that he and I played poker together uh, at my house, you know, with three or four friends and one, one, $2, but we always, he and I always won. And he, uh, he called me when I was about 20, 21 and uh, 22, maybe he goes, did you know that there's legalized poker in Phoenix? And I said, no, he goes, it's out at Fort McDowell. And it was like a 30, 40 minute, 40 minute drive. And he goes, do you want to go out there some night? I go, yes, I want to go out there. So he and I went out there, we pulled into the, into the, uh, up to the casino and he looks at me and he goes, our lives have changed. Right. <laughs> and and it was, you know, like we're 20 years, he was a good buddy of mine. And he, it turns out he it didn't change his life at all. He played a few tournaments and did pretty well, but didn't didn't seem to care about it as much as I did. But I, I started spending a lot of time out there. And I started at 3, 6 and 4, 8 and, you know, 5, 10 and 10, 20. And uh, when I got to about 22, 23, you know, I was making money and, and uh, I told my wife I wanted to go to Vegas and she wasn't a big, she's a lady that recently died in a car crash. But I, I told her that, you know, I wanted to go to Vegas and play up there. And so uh, she wasn't a big fan. This is a pretty funny story. So I flew up to Vegas to play 10, 20 Hold'em. They didn't have anything that big in Phoenix at the time. Uh, and she would only let me take $200. You got 10 bets. <laughs> So, so I'm flying to Vegas. I got, you know, a 20, $21 ticket both ways, you know, $42. I'm literally, I get in a, uh, a limousine that takes people to every hotel. It was $1.75. And, uh, you know, I tip the quarter, you know, <laughs> $2 because I had to have my $200 stake for the 10, 20 game. I literally went up and won uh, five times in a row taking $200 out. And uh, she still didn't like it. You know, it was just not her thing. Her, her dad was very conservative. So, you know, I played and then uh, I started playing out at Fort McDowell and playing a little bit higher out there. They started getting higher games. And um, so uh, then, then later, you know, we got divorced around 36 and I was able to start playing higher and felt comfortable playing higher. And I ended up playing, I was pretty much a regular at the four and 800 uh, game up at the Blasio and we played three and a 600 here. We played pot limit, uh, $100 Annie, uh, Raz and, uh, pot limit Omaha, $100 Annie and one and 200 here in Phoenix. So it was a big game. Uh, but there was a guy that we played Raz with you, Danny, a hundred dollars. You know, he had a King, he'd bring it in for a hundred. You'd pot it. He'd call. You know, you'd catch a, a nine, he'd catch a queen, he'd move the two cards over and say, I don't need those. You'd bet the pot, he would call. <laughs> like it was, it was insane, right? And yeah. every once in a while, he would make a wheel on you, you know, and have to catch a runner, as runner, they runner, do. runner. But as they do, yeah, as they do. And at the same time, you go nice hand, right? And that's, that's the way you do it. But so I started playing uh, pretty high, you know, of four and 800 and, but, you know, I played as high as two and 4,000 like limit up there at the Bellagio. And um, yeah, those, those you know, are, those once. are massive yeah. games. Yeah. I played 1500, 3000 quite a bit and one, 1000, 2000 quite a bit. And, you know, that's when I was playing guys and they would come in, they won a tournament and they'd come in and they'd lose a lot of money. And I'm like, I, I'm better. I think I'm better than that guy. Why don't I play tournaments? Right. I never really cared a lot for no limit hold'em. I was more of a mixed game player. But I had some success, you know, a couple final tables at WPT and, you know, had some deep runs in the main event twice. And could so. you could you speak to, um, you know, your, your first marriage and uh, sort of the, you know, the friction as it relates to playing cards and, and gambling that I'm sure lots of folks who listen right right now in the audience may feel from, you know, their significant other, um, just which to me... Uh, can take a pretty big toll and just create a 
you know, a fairly negative situation. Do you have any um, wisdom or advice as it relates to that? So, yeah, I do. Uh, she was not happy about it. Her, her father came, you know, had a job, same job for 30 some years, came home, ate dinner at 530 every night. Uh, no risk, no nothing, just, you know, had two weeks vacation and just nothing, nothing out of line. Right. And so when you're, when you want to play poker, um, it's, it, it creates a lot of stress for somebody who doesn't like risk. And um, she was very risk averse. Uh, you know, so she, you know, she, I did it, but what I did is I created rules. And if the rules weren't in place, uh, because I already know I'm kind of a little bit starting in the hole, right? If I'm going to go out and play poker, I'm already in the hole. So I had a list of about 10 things. One is, do I have all the things done that she wants me to do? So, you know, she wanted me to take the garbage out or paint the house or whatever it is, you know, there's some sink that's not working or whatever. Um, do I have that done, right? Are my kids in bed, right? And so there were literally about, I would say, eight to 10 things. There was a checklist that I wouldn't play unless those things were clear because I knew if I went out and I knew I was going to get my head handed to me. I will not be successful. So the one thing, the one reason I can keep playing, the one way to keep playing is to keep winning. And so you won't keep winning if you don't do all of the right things uh, to go out and play. And that's so my mind needed to be extremely clear. I'm, I have a very guilty, you know, I was raised a Catholic, so I'm very a guilty kind of a conscience kind of a person. So I can't play poker if I had anything wrong like that. So winning meant i kept playing so that was you know that was key right? yeah that's so uh, rule, rule number one is winning and, and rule number two is making sure you know the ducks are in a row everything is taken care of yeah um, b before you go out yeah have a checklist whatever it is that your wife you know doesn't <laughs> like or doesn't or you know it made me do a lot of chores that i really didn't want to do or made me do a lot of projects that I, you know, I would put off, but I did them because I'm going to have a happy wife and she's going to, it's kind of my reward to go out and play poker. Listen, I just painted the bedroom and, uh, you know, this weekend or whatever. And so, uh, all of that stuff's really important to me. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned, you know, that, that she was risk averse and you are risk inclined I assume if you're playing 2K, 4K, you're pretty inclined yeah, to risk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so after, you know, after the divorce, um, I guess you are moving up stakes, like after buying in for $200 at the 1020, coming home, like just over time, you're just kind of steadily yeah. um, building your business career and moving up in stakes when you play poker at the same time. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, after uh, I got divorced, I, I felt, you know, listen, it's just, I will have a roof over my kids' heads, and I will feed them, uh, but I do think I'm better than most people. And, and, and my results, I was very passionate uh, about keeping records. Yeah. Because there's a lot of times when, you know, let's say you're, let's say you're playing poker and you're winning, um, but you're spending the money on things you know, put new wood floors in or do something, right? You're spending the money and you start thinking like, am I really winning, right? Or you're losing and you take money out. You know how people say, oh, I'm about even. If anybody says they're about even, they aren't. I promise you, they are not about even. Um, but so I was uh, passionate about keeping records because I wanted to understand whether I'm actually good at this or not. And also understand at some point, can I quit my job? And I just quit my job and, and feel like, yeah, I can, I can support my family. I'm not taking, you know, I, I was not afraid of risk, but I was also, you know, if you have data and you make a, a, a decision, like, you know, it's no different than if you've got a wife that doesn't like you playing, well, show her what you're doing, right? Show her that this is what I do. This is how much money I've made. This is my hourly rate over a long period of time. And so uh, I take this extremely seriously, right? And uh, if she doesn't think you take it very seriously and you come home drunk or you, you know, like you literally have leaks, it's going to be hard to support your decision to do that. 
And uh, but if you if you can show that you're running it like a business, and I'm taking it really as seriously as I possibly can, I've taken this more seriously than my job. So uh, I want to win, and I'm going to do everything I can to win. And here's how I'm doing: I'm making X dollars an hour playing poker. You can start to have them. Some women may may never get there, right? It's just it goes against. Uh, you know, and it's, it's similar, like it's one of the things that I've always believed in, right? Uh, find your success first, then find a woman. Because it's really hard, you know, let's say you want to be a musician. It's really hard for a woman to <clears throat> stick with you when, you know, you're playing gigs and bars and doing stuff and you're not having, you know, you're, you know, it's really hard. But if you become successful, it's really easy for your woman to go, yeah, he's playing his music. He needs time. I got to leave him alone. Yeah, you know, that's what I think. And so, if you if you want a poker career, it's a it's a bad idea to get a wife first. Yeah, like like we we talked about in, in the pre call. You know, the graph goes up and down. It, it is not linear, straight up. And so, um, waiting until you know you have enough data to where it is up enough to where you can sort of quantify that, that success and it, and really doesn't really apply only to poker, but in any field, I would imagine. Yeah, it does. It does. You know, it's funny. I have, I have friends that are professionals and one of them was on a losing streak and I'm like, why are you going to go play? Right. He goes, I got to get my hours in. I'm like, no, no, no. And, and, because I don't believe it's about getting your hours in. And I know that goes contrary to a lot of people, but there's something else going wrong when you're on a, on a, granted, I've been on losing streaks. I've run bad, but then I start thinking, am I really running as bad as I, as I think I am? Am I making things happen that are bad? Right. And so like, if I lose, if I lose a couple times in a row or I have a big loss, I won't play for three weeks. And I think, one of the other rules that I have, I haven't always done this, but I've been pretty successful at doing this, is I will never lose more in a game than I think I could win the next time I come out and play. And because the next time I come out and play, I don't want to feel like there's no way I could possibly win what I lost last time. Mentally, I think that really screws with me. I don't know about other people, but um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit more mental you know, when it comes to those psychological uh, issues. And so I, I guard against that. Uh, yeah. Well, you're a I, human being. And yeah. last, last I checked poker is comprised of, of human beings playing the game. Um, yeah. uh, so as it relates to, you know, your friend getting in their hours, right. And this is yeah. sort of, I mean, this is something that I've experienced and, and I feel like I've learned from throughout my career. Is it like poker is a gig where you don't get paid to show up? You get right. paid to play with intensity. You get paid um, to make good decisions. And as you said earlier, right? Like it's just making good decision after good decision. Um, the, the side effect is that you win money from those good decisions. And anytime that I've ever just been like, okay, I'm going to like play 50 hours this week. And then I'm just like showing up to get my hours in, my, the right. level of my play drops off a cliff. Like I, I just, it's somehow in my brain, I think, oh, if I just fill this seat for 10 hours every day, like right. the money will just come. I'm not focusing on like playing at a high level and making great decisions, which like that is where the winning comes from. That's where a successful career comes from is just making high level, intense, good decision after good decision after good decision. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what people think. Just show up. No, no, it's not. It's, 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 and you can't do that at work either, right? You can't just show up and sit in a chair and hope good things happen. You got to make shit happen at work. You know, you got to go in and drive results. And it's no different in poker. You have to drive the results. You can't, you know, and that's where I was really good about, I think I was really good about um, when I wasn't ready to play mentally and I wasn't ready to play my best, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. Like I would lose every time I would go and feel this, you know, like, I don't even know if I want to be here, like, but I got to, you know, I want to win money. And, yeah. Know. Learning no. from our mistakes, learning no. from our failures, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I have uh, something that I think is really interesting that your listeners might, might enjoy. Um, I have this, 
And I think everyone has this and you have to tap into it, right? So uh, I was up in uh, Vegas and I was with my wife and her mom and we were gonna meet for dinner. So I went over to play poker, which she was fine with. And I was, I was, I went, I was up like 30,000 playing a three and 600, I think it's three and 600 or four and 800 game, mixed game, deuce to seven, and Badoogie and all that stuff. And, you know, there were like four players. I was in like the eight seat with my feet up on the seven seat. You know, I had my shit all over the table, <laughs> sprawled out, everything. I just kind of leaning back and just, just all I was doing was this, you know. And um, in the middle of a deuce to seven hand, Cindy Violet comes up. And she's a nice lady, but, she, you know, she's a New Yorker kind of person. She goes, whose stuff is this? And I was in the middle of a hand and everything just felt wrong all of a sudden, right? Like my mojo was, you know, everything was good. I had my beer, you know, drink sipping on my beer and everything. And all of a sudden, I it was two hours before dinner. And I, I had this feeling like I should just quit. I lost that hand and I was just rolling over the game. And I'm like, everything now, I got to move my shit. You know, I got to put my feet up. I got to, everything's different. And just, and I know this is stuff that mathematicians hate, right? No, you don't do that. But I, I have this thing where, so anyway, I didn't quit. Even though I, I said to myself, I should quit. I was up like 30, ended up losing 20, right? I just lost every pot. And so, uh, I started, I had this theory and it was, it's called uh, the, the leaving feeling, right? I don't know if you've ever had this where just something clicks. Some guy sits down and he smells, some guy's breath smells like cigarettes. And it just like, all of a sudden you were feeling good and all of a sudden, boom, like something just doesn't feel right. Right. So every time I had that feeling, I would write down that I have that feeling. The goal was, the goal was to quit every time I had that. But I wanted to also gather data, right? So I was playing 75, 150 mostly in Phoenix at the time. And uh, not leaving. So I, I would write all this down, right? Like, this is where I am when I have that feeling. Uh, I, would, I lost 100 grand by not leaving when I had that. Playing 75, 150. That's a lot of bets. Down. It's a lot of bets. And it was over, you know, six months, right? And I still won. I still won. But uh, there's just something where you're, everything's right. Everything's right with your head. Everything's right with the environment. And all of a sudden, it, 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 for me, for me, I listen to that like it's religion. Yeah. Because you, I just, I just. What do you make of it? Like, what, what are what are the sort of cues? I th uh, I th so it's it's literally anything like that was a perfect example. Cindy coming going in the middle of a hand in, in, in draw where you literally need to pay attention to how people are looking at their cards, you know, how many they drew each round and all of that stuff, uh, how they're putting their bets in. And, you know, she's a pro. She knows better to ask when someone's in a hand who's sitting, whose shit is this, right? Was she like coming to the and game just, or just... She was getting, she wanted to sit down. She was trying mm. to figure out where she was going to sit. Gotcha. I'm in a hand. She, my stuff's sitting in the seat right next to me. Who's is this? I'm like, hey, hey, do you mind if we finish the hand, right? Yeah. And I just, it, it just felt like I don't want to be here all of a sudden. And I have this weird feeling where I can instantly go, all of a sudden, I don't like what just happened. I'm not, it's, it's not good. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and, and it's just, I, I don't know. I think if you start paying attention to that, because I know that you're not supposed to do stuff like that. You get your hours in blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but, but, uh, I'm, I'm very sensitive to, to, to the environment changing the game changing me, not let's say, and it's not about an unlucky dealer. It's about a dealer that's being a, you know, weird or dick or about something, or there's an argument at the table, and I'm like, ah, and just you know, it's so just it's not more, my thing, right? Yeah, it, it it's sounds a, like it's, it's more a gut of, feel. It sounds like it's more of something affecting you that sort it of is. turns your on switch to off and recognizing yeah. that you're not on yeah. anymore. It it does, yeah. Hmm, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And I, you know, I documented it because I'm like, oh, and I don't want to be, you know, like 
this foo foo <laughs> crap, right? You know, and not have a but but for me, for me, every time I stayed when I had that feeling, but I was kind of like pissed, like going, okay, that son of a bitch beat me out of a pot. I'm gonna beat him, you know, he's not good or he's whatever, you know. Um uh it it didn't work out well for me staying. Yeah. And and uh, sometimes I was losing and I just felt like this is going to be bad or, uh, and I know that that's, you know, I think there's more to our brains than we give it credit. And so I can't explain it, but I can understand that it's there. Could you dive a little deeper into that um, more in our brains than we give credit? So uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was raised, um, I had three sisters. So I feel like I'm more empathetic than most dudes that had three brothers, right? They got the shit beat out of them and blah, 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 right? And I feel that that's helped my poker career because I, I can literally, I feel like, uh, feel what other people are feeling a little bit better than other people can. Um, and so therefore, I can put myself in their position a little bit better than other people can. Mm -hmm. And I think that's helpful when playing poker and understanding kind of how they're feeling. Right. Yeah. And, and I can't explain it, but I do think that there are some people that are more in tune with others. You know, you've, you've been around people who have are oblivious to someone who's like, um, you know, lost their dog or something. They're just oblivious. They don't even know that this guy, there's something different about him. Right. Mm -hmm. He's hurting or, 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 you know, whatever it is, right? There's some people that can't pick up on that. And I think that's been a real, a part of my success is, is kind of being able to feel other people and how they're, how they're feeling. The decision to enter a hand is fundamental to poker strategy. Too tight, and they know what you have. Too loose, and you're easy to run over. Pre-flop bootcamp from Chasing Poker Greatness is a comprehensive guide to locking down your pre-flop game and creating true range advantage. Eight days of guided training, over 60 optimal ranges, and access to a dedicated community of players that will push your pre-flop game from a place of weakness to your greatest strength. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp. Available now. John, I wanted to ask you why you decided to invest in a preflop boot camp. Everything that you had done with me to that point, or I had heard you do, had impressed me. I love the podcast. I accidentally ended up in the poker power hour and loved that. And then I took coaching and then you recommended the boot camp, and at first I didn't think it was, you know, something that would be that valuable. But I was like, everything else has been amazing, so I signed up, and then it just blew me away. And what about boot camp blew you away? Like it started off slow. Like I'm learning these ranges, and I'm not even understanding what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, as I start to understand what we're doing with the three bets, the four bets, and all of a sudden it just kind of hit me. And I was like, oh my God, how do I not know this stuff? This is amazing. The more I studied them, I started to understand why they were constructed sometimes. Like I'd be like, that's why that's like that. And that would lead to more revelations and just a better understanding of poker in general. Do you have any interesting takeaways from your boot camp experience? The most interesting thing about the boot camp it's a pre-flop boot camp, but I feel like it's done as much for my post game as it did for my pre-game, just because I'm not in as many awkward and bad situations as I found myself in. You know, when we were doing coaching before the boot camp, we couldn't get through 10, 15 minutes of tape without finding mistake after mistake. And then once we did the boot camp, it solved problems on the back end as well. I know you've studied for a thousand hours this year. How do you think boot camp compares to your other poker study? Oh, it's crazy. The boot camp is probably the most important thing I've done all year out of everything. I would give anything to go back and to, to know that stuff 10 years ago. 
I can't imagine how successful I'd be right now if I had known that stuff. And I thought the boot camp was so valuable that I literally insisted you take more money from me and paid you more for the boot camp because I was blown away. I just thought the price was too cheap. And it's changed my game in ways that I, I can't even explain to you. If you'd like to join the next round of Preflop Boot Camp, which starts on the last Saturday of every month, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp to lock up your spot. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp. So there is this phenomenon that I just discussed uh, a few podcasts back about when a tight player sort of just goes off like a rocket, just like crazily, where it's like just totally unexpected with like a hand that just is just weird. It's just like bizarre. Like if you chose to go off with that hand, like what was preventing you from going off with the last hundred hands that you played? But for some reason, like you like I can feel it about to happen. Like, I just know that for whatever reason, this player is about to go off. Um, And I think that like a lot of the edge, a lot of edge in poker comes from knowing your opponents better than they know themselves, knowing, knowing their strategy better than, you know, they themselves know their strategy so that then you can see the vulnerabilities. Um, And in the sense of like emotions, understanding people's emotions better than they understand right. their own emotions. As you can well, see right? it. You can see it. You can feel it. There's an interesting experiment about uh, rats. Uh, they had two rooms of rats. One room with rats had soothing music on and like playgrounds for the rats to go up and down and plenty of food. And then there was another room that had like hard rock or acid rock and And uh, they had electrical impulses that they were giving to the rats, um, you know, randomly. And so you could take a rat from this great environment and put it into this other environment. And without shocking it or doing anything, the rat's heart rate would match the heart rate of the rest of the rats in the room. And vice versa, right? You take the rat of the of the one room where it's we're being stimulated and scared to death, and all of a sudden you take them to the room where these rats have a very calm heart rate, then they they start to mirror that. And so therefore you can kind of sense like what you're saying, you can sense somebody else's heart rate and their and their their uh you, you know their agitation and their this. You can walk into a room and you can go, uh oh, what's going on in here, right? You know that someone just had a fight or there's some really heavy emotions and feelings, right? And it's so like some people can pick that up in humans better than others because they're just more observant and uh, not necessarily staring at people, but being able to feel that. And I I 100% believe that. Yeah, I I believe it too. And I think there's just a lot of like biological reasons as to why that's beneficial to us as as human beings, you know? Um, And then at the poker table is sort of like, this interesting stage of pressure and emotions and just human psychology, behavior and math, like all these things are kind of thrown together. I think the pressure aspect of it is one of the more important ingredients as it relates to understanding and predicting behavior. Absolutely. I love watching people under pressure uh, in hands. I've made a lot of money uh, from from watching people under pressure and what they do and, and how they do it. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun because it's, it's become so predictive uh, with some people, not everybody, but there's some people you just, you can watch them and go, wow, they're literally telling me what they have based upon the way they're behaving. And it's, it's, it's fun when uh, one of my favorites was, um, I was playing this one hand I was out in Atlantic City uh, playing Pot Limit Omaha. It was probably like a 25-50 Pot Limit Omaha game. And there was, uh, I'm going to say, I don't know, 8,000 in the pot. And this guy, uh, this guy, I had maybe, let's say, 8,000 left, and he bet 6,500, 6, right? I did not have much of a hand at all. I, like, literally can only beat a bluff. and uh, And I wasn't sure I could beat a bluff. 
So I just sat and thought and go, wow, do, like what, what play do I have here? Right. I only have like 1500 more. So I'm going to raise 1500 and he's going to have to fold right uh, into a pot. That's, you know, call it 15,000. Like the, that doesn't make any sense, you know, yeah. but I was sitting watching and watching and watching him. And he literally pushed away from the table. Like he was getting so uncomfortable and he got as far away from the table as he possibly could. And um, I'm like, wow, he looks really uncomfortable. So I raised him my, you know, I called his 6,500 bet and raised him 1,500 and he instantly folded. <laughs> and it was just, a, you know, like it's, it's a play that most people wouldn't even think is a possibility right but if the guy has absolutely nothing he missed like wraps and all this stuff like small wraps and um uh and and you know just just being able to pay attention and noticing like it made me a lot of money that just that one play um one of my favorites i was uh playing uh, at the world series uh, main event and, a, and a, a guy that i know uh, was at the table and he's a pro uh but i didn't play much with him he was mostly a limit guy but um, he raised uh, pre-flop in early position, and I had two queens, and I re-raised him. And uh, it came around to him, and he re-raised, right? And he was, you know, not a tricky player, but he wasn't straightforward all the time. But all of a sudden, his nostrils were like, I felt like they were going to hit me, right? <laughs> and so I literally, they were like, it was the biggest nostril flare I ever. That's what it felt like to me, right? And um, so I'm like, well, I think he's got two aces or two kings. I just knew it, right, based on his nostril flare. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to get the information. And, and you know, if I just fold it and said, hey, nice hand, I'm not going to get the information. He's not going to turn over his hand. So I'm like, well, what's a creative way that I can get him to feel like he was unlucky and he'll show me his hand? You're thinking so, about this like on the fly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about I want to see his hand, but I know if I just fold, he won't show it to me. So um, I'm like, wow, you know, I was in a call you, but I got to pee so bad. And I turned over <laughs> two queens, right? I turned over two queens. And he's like, I'm so unlucky. I'm so unlucky. And he throws over two aces, right? So now I know that this big nostril flare, anytime he has it, now I don't mind playing like a hand like four or five suited or something like that against him because I'm not, not going to lose much, right? But I could, I could bust him. But I also know where he is when, when he's got this big nostril flare. And it happened again uh, later on in the tournament. And I was able to play accordingly. And I can't remember exactly what happened. But, but you know, like literally. So, so people need to think about, like, how do I get this tell, right? And, you know, if you're playing with a good player, he's not going to show you his hand. He wouldn't have shown me his hand if I just threw it away. But anyway, that's, that's the, the level where... You, you get to the point where you're even trying to figure out how to see somebody's hand, right? Where instead of just folding and going, I, I, but I wanted to get the information right then so I could use it for the rest of the tournament, right? Yeah. You um, had a theory um, and you needed evidence to support the theory. Yeah. Um, and that was exactly. figuring out some way to get him to, to show you and confirm. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, you've, you've mentioned that you're not at the top of your game these days. How much poker are you playing? Um, you know, what's the what's the life of the donkey bomber these days look like? Uh, so I have a job as a CFO for a company that, that makes off-road aftermarket uh, parts. So for vehicles like Jeeps and trucks or, you know, lift kits and suspensions and things like that. Um, you know, I have a small piece of equity and, and uh, you know, I just, I kind of go back and forth in between poker and business, but if I feel like I'm not playing my best and the truth of the matter is it's, it's, I lost my love of the game, you know, where that's the kind of stuff I wanted to, I wanted to sit and think about, right. That's what I wanted to think about. That's what I wanted to do. And I loved being able to figure that stuff out. And I got to the point where it wasn't a passion of mine to, to get, that deep into the game right and so why do you think uh, you that know, happened i've well i married i married my third wife she wasn't that much into poker and i kind of was uh, you know it's really hard to uh, be married to somebody that's not really into what you do right you know and and uh also you know there's the parts of the casino that 
you know, people who don't go to the casino have visions of the poker room as hot chicks walking around in slinky outfits in the poker room. And I'm like, it is the exact opposite of that. You know, it's a bunch of crusty old dudes, people that are pissed off. And <laughs> Wearing like, sweatpants. T- and <laughs> you know, yeah. And I told her, I like, you know, if a hot woman, wa- if, it, if a naked woman walks by in a poker room, everybody's going to go, look at that. She's fucking hot, right? Uh, deal the cards, right? That's this next <laughs> line, right? Deal the cards. What are you waiting for, man? I'm stuck, right? Mm-hmm. And But they don't get that. You know, my first, my first wife's um, father thought I was cheating on her because no one plays poker till six in the morning. All right. What's he doing? He's not playing poker till six in the morning. Yeah. I'm like, I would literally play 24 hours if I could. Right. Which everyone plays poker, you know, like when you're first learning the game and you, the game is good, you know, you play till six in the morning. That's, that's, that's a nothing. Right. Yeah. That's that's all the time. That's life. (laughs) Right. That's, that's when the games start. That's when the guys get off of work and they, you know, they play till, they get off at eight and come into play. Right. So, but you know, people just don't understand it. And she didn't, you know, my third wife, I think didn't understand it or appreciate it as much. Well, the world series was a little bit different for her, but your, your second, second wife was a professional poker player, right? Or a yeah, poker, poker yeah. player. She, she, she was a poker dealer when I met her and she had some really good runs. She had two or three final tables at the world series. She's a good, like uh, limit, uh, you know, Omaha and deuce to seven, triple draw. And, you know, she was really good at those games. Yeah. So yeah. you went no poker, poker, no poker. <laughs> yeah. I, I went no poker to, you know, I could call her and say I'm, I'm stuck 30,000. She'd say, you'll get it back. Yeah. You, know, you want to play longer? You'll get it back. You know, it's kind of a very, you know, like not a panic. Like I, I didn't, you know, there was no panic there. Right. It was literally, you know, you know, stay as long as you need, you know, and I could play till six in the morning and she didn't think a thing about it. Right. She didn't think I was doing anything, which I wasn't, you know, but it was very, it was easy to play uh, poker around her. And, you know, that's not to say the other women are wrong. It's just, you know, it's, it's just what you're used to, you know, she'd been dealing poker her whole life. Yeah. So People have different, to. different life experiences, right. And yeah. take things different ways. And I mean, that that's just how it is, but yeah. Yeah. So third, third wife didn't really like poker so much and you started, uh, not, uh, yeah, just kind of fell out of love with, with poker as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I did. And I think partially because, you know, I'm not feeling good about going to the casino, right. Once again, you know, and so, um, and yeah, so I have three ex-wives and uh <laughs> what have we learned is it is a fourth poker yeah. again is that the <laughs> the sequence no, I, I i haven't learned anything i <laughs> the funny thing is is i'm good friends with with all of them unfortunately my first wife just died but uh i was good friends with her like you know i i, I don't have uh i don't like uh hard feelings right you know everybody's like you say it's 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 life and we all have our own experiences and but they're all good ladies. And, you know, I was, I am, I'm friends with them and, and it, it makes life better that way to be friends with, uh, you know, people that you've had relationships with. There's obviously something there and nobody was like doing terrible things or, you know, just, just, just the way it is. Right. Yeah. But no, I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's another, I don't know. I don't well, know. I, I won't say no. Cause I've said <laughs> no to, I've said never again twice. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, I haven't been able to stick with it. Um, have you gotten back into poker since the, the third ex-wife? So, uh, not much. I no. haven't played in six months. Um, and partially because my job is extremely stressful. Uh, I mean, like, just constantly solving problems and, and working on, on difficult, you know, issues and, and, uh, you know, going a hundred miles an hour at work. So it's, you know, I, it's, I'm just not the right mindset to play poker. And I think, you know, in a, in a fairly short period of time, I, I did plan on going to the world series this year, but, um, I'm not vaccinated. So I just didn't go. Um, but I hope that, all of that kind of gets back to normal and I can play the world series. That's really my, my, you know, if I had to give up cash or the world series, I would give up cash just because I love the, that, that it's, it's such an electric electrifying environment. 
and it's it's so much fun to be there and see all my friends and you know uh i i love that part of it yeah that's uh i mean that's that's quite the the journey huh from like only playing cash no tournaments to being like yeah if i never play cash again i'm i'm i would be okay as long as i can play these tournaments at the wsop yeah yeah i know it's 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 weird uh but you know i know people who go through the same same kind of thing and you know uh out here uh i stopped going to the casino two years ago because of covid and you know um having to wear a mask, which uh, I, I I know I would want to kill myself if I sat at a table and had to wear a mask and people were wearing a mask, which is, you know, taking away some of my edge, I think. Um, and so I just don't like that environment. So I also know that if I went and played, I would literally, it's so I'm like, I can't, I can't go. It's just, it would drive me insane. Um, any advice for somebody that has been in poker and wants to transition out of poker like transferable skills you know from poker to another industry or another trade yeah so i think uh, as i said before if you understand uh things like expected value right and that's a simple concept but you can take the the probabilities of different events occurring right, and and multiply them by the expected uh, financial outcome and usually come up with better decisions than most people in business, right? I also think that, you know, most poker players are mathematically inclined. Uh, and I think that the mathematics of poker uh, lends itself really well to the mathematics of business. And, and you know, you can, you can think of things differently than people in business and people will go, wow, I've never thought of it that way, right? Um, and you can, you can literally stand out by the way that you talk about decisions and numbers and and things like that. And I think though, it's really important, you know, if you're, if you're especially looking for a financial job, it's, it's a bad idea to lead with poker, right? With, if you're looking for a job anywhere, it's a bad idea to lead with poker. I just, you, you are, you know, once you're, that once you get the job, uh, it's okay to let people know, but it's a bad idea to lead with poker. So like even on my resume, uh, I would put, because I felt like it was important to be honest, but I would just put player of the year at World Series, you know, 2007, so that they'd go, okay, he's an accomplished poker player, not a degenerate, right? And, yeah. and some people understand the difference there, but not everybody. And so, um, but literally you know like i have had uh, people in in business ceos ask me hey i'm going into a into a negotiation can you give me some pointers on tells things that i should look for and i i would literally write a page of tells for them so that they could they could watch how people are reacting to various things and they'll know whether they're going down the right path or not on these negotiations and um but all of that stuff is really important being aware of of how people are are uh accepting your message right is really important in business and i think uh, you know creating you know culture is really important and i think that's when you take culture from uh, the poker table which i think the culture of most poker tables has gotten a lot worse really than it used to be yeah what do you mean by that for, for instance well for instance the idea of sitting at a table uh, 20, 30 years ago with nobody having iPods and, and, and things in their ears. The conversation is what keeps the, the business guys coming. They want to hang out with the fellas, right? They want to feel like I gambled, you know, and I hung out with the fellas and we were talking about chicks and basketball and whatever. You create an environment with your words at poker if everybody's sitting there playing words with friends and staring at their phone and watching a movie and hey it's your turn and you don't have camaraderie with the bad players the come the bad players get tired and leave they they come for an experience right and that's the thing that people have lost is the bad players want the experience and they're not even getting that anymore and then they're getting made fun of for playing you know i'll never forget when people started telling these bad players Hey, listen, you were only getting uh, three to one odds and you were a 10 to one underdog. And they like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Right. So now all of a sudden these bad players know they're getting they're getting uh, picked on 
They're, they're outskilled, which is not what you want them to think. You want them to think they're gambling with the fellas and damn, that guy's lucky. That's what you want them to think. And as soon as you start talking about poker and then they, then they understand you have a skill they don't have, you've literally trained your customer either to, to quit because they're outskilled or to, to figure out how to learn the game better because business people don't like getting beat. And so uh, that's the environment that I'm talking about that's changed that I really, it's in, in some ways ruined the game. Like I want to go out too. I want to, you know, if I don't play very much anymore, I don't want a bunch of people with headphones in. I, I want to talk to people, right? And, and hang out, right? I so want that too. That's I mean, what I think. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of the conversation, like as a professional and, and having, you know, an hourly rate in the game that I play in, right? Like I enjoy speaking with businessmen that can give me life advice and wisdom and just have right. conversations, getting to know people. I mean, I just can't even describe the the good things that have come from building those relationships and just being like a fun person to play poker with, right? Like that's that's right. ultimately what you, what you want to be, um, in in my opinion. And by the way, if you're the pro, that's the fun guy to have. You're the pro that's going to get invited. Sure, right? of course. You're, right? you're gonna you're gonna be the one that's going to get invited to where mostly business guys. But hey, I know you're not going to be a dick to these people. Well, they're going to have fun. I'm going to tell jokes at the table. I'm going to, they're going to have a good time playing with me. That's yeah. really what I want. And, I mean, and if you're the dick that sits there and stares at your phone, you don't get invited even to games where there's a lot of pro professionals. You're no fun. Yeah. I mean, you like know? I'm the, I guess when anybody asks me at the poker table, uh, I guess, you know, I'm 38 now and uh, people are aware that poker professional poker players are a thing. I've never lied about what I do or whatever, why I'm there. Um, but always try to be fun and courteous and just like a good loser. I think that's something that's like other people take a lot of uh, delight in when you lose and, and you're a good loser as well. Um, yeah. what, one of you know my, my favorite personal stories is I, I made friends with a guy in at Commerce in Los Angeles um, who is a billionaire. And just by playing poker and laughing and having conversation with him, um, you know, like a week later, I was like flying to Vegas on his private jet with him, right? Like he invited me, yeah, a poker player, yeah. like into his world when he had played poker forever and hadn't invited any poker players into his world. Um, and right. that's just like, you know, it's a, it's a one-off weird thing that happened. But the reality is that like, People want to have fun. They want to make friends. They want to hang out with the boys and have a good experience. And yeah. like you said, that's what brings them back to playing poker tomorrow and next week. And pros should really bear that in mind. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. I'm like, there's so many people I don't want to play poker with too. You know, so many people I don't want to play with. And sometimes it's because they're good. But most of the time, I don't mind playing with a, a good player. But if they're a dick, I, oh, man. I just, I literally don't want to, it, it, it throws my vibe off a lot because <laughs> I like, I, I don't want to see the dealer get the cards thrown out. Like it just, it just doesn't work for me. And yeah. so, you know, I have a lot of things like that that I'm probably weak at because I, I should just sit there and, you know, but I just, you know, it's, I don't like being around it. And, and, uh, but you're right. Like I was playing with uh, Rene Angelil, uh, Celine's husband, right? And so I played a decent amount of poker with him. And, you know, if I played in a tournament, he would literally ask everybody at the table if they were nice. He'd go, hey, well, let's go to dinner on break. I'm buying. Mm -hmm. He'd buy like a, you know, a $600 meal for everybody. And then I called him up and I said, hey, I got a friend coming in town. She's had cancer. You've had cancer. You're an inspiration to, you know, and I go, I'll pay whatever. I want, I want good seats for him. And he goes, okay, I'll take care of it. And so anyway, uh, he goes, they tell him to go to the box office. And this lady is like a Celine, like fan. super fan, yeah. super fan. Right. So, uh, hit my buddy picks up the tickets and they keep walking and keep walking. They're walking down and like, they ended up with his seats, you know, Renee's seats. She watched the show, cried the whole way through. And I called and said, and I want to thank you. And he goes, no, thank you for allowing me to do that. I'm like, what a classy dude, right? But if I was a douchebag, uh, he wouldn't do that. And, you know, he's a billionaire. They're billionaires too, you know, like it's, but you have an opportunity to hang out with some really impressive people. And by the way, when you start running bad at poker, but you've handled yourself really classy, 
uh, and, and he's, he's got something that, you know, and you see, he sees that you're smart, maybe that you do make a transition into business, right? If you're running bad, but if you're, if you're a dick at the table, which, uh, you know, listen, they're your customers, man. That's the thing that I don't, and, and some of them are your competitors. The good ones are your competitors, but there's your customers and you, you got to treat them. So they come back, right? That's, that's the whole idea. Yeah. And I'm, even as it relates to your competitors, uh, I think that like there's a lot to be gained by fostering friendships with uh, like-minded people who are also competitors. Like iron sharpens iron, and most of the the biggest upgrades that I've made over the course of my poker career have been through having high-level discussions with my fellow poker professionals. Um, yeah. Because they have a, a, a lifetime of experience um, and a way they look at things, and they can give you insight in, in ways that you, maybe you didn't ever consider, and, and you can do the same for them. And when both of you make that connection, um, you're just both better for it. So, like, yeah, there, there's no reason to be discourteous or a shithead to really anybody that you play poker right. against. Right, right. Um, yeah. Unless they start making fun of somebody or start, like, throwing cards to the dealer or something in that case, yeah. in that case, that kind of like get, that gets me going. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't take that. Um, a lot of this stuff I'm talking about actually, actually it was, uh, I don't know if you know this, I wrote a book. It's the same kind of stuff. It's not really, it's like, it's like life advice is seen through a poker player and business person's eyes. Yeah. And um, oops, I won too much money. But, yeah. uh, I got it here in my yeah, research paper. <laughs> oh, there you go. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, um, that's a funny. St- the 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 title there is about. Um, I was playing um, seventy five one fifty and cross booking with a guy who had presumably been running fairly hot, but I think he'd start. You know, he, he wanted to cross book with me, and people always like to cross book with me. It's kind of funny. Um, Could you uh, explain so cross it. cross booking if there's a, a listener that doesn't understand? Yeah, that? yeah. So. Um, like let's say you're playing 75 150 and you're cross booking uh if you if i'm cross booking with you and you win a thousand i'm going to pay you a thousand and if i lose a thousand i'm going to pay you also a thousand so you're going to win two thousand it's the difference between our results basically mm-hmm. and sometimes you'll cross book at 50 percent or 100 percent or 150 percent if you're playing in a low game you want to play higher and so uh, I cross book with him and I won and he lost. I won like 13, five off of him. And uh, I called him the next day. And this is what I'm talking about feeling, right? I called him the next day. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you the next day. And it was like noon and he didn't reach out to me and I knew he left. So he wasn't at the casino. And so it wasn't like he was up late. And so I reached out to him at noon and I reached out to him at two and uh, I just wanted, and he didn't respond to my my call or my uh, voicemail. So the next day I'm at the casino and I said, Hey, this guy owes me $13,000. Does anybody want to buy it? Like he's good for the money. What are you talking about? Like, I don't know. I just want to sell it. And I sold it for 50% and it took him two and a half years to get like $9,000. But it's going with your gut, right? I'm really big on going with your gut. There's this, another interesting story. Um, uh, there was this uh, book written by Malcolm Gladwell uh, Blink. called, I think it was Blink, yeah. And there's this, there's this concept called intuitive repulsion. And they had this, uh, these um, art, these, these people, historians, right, that could look at art and determine how, or relics, and determine whether they were fake or not and how old they were, right? So they had these people, uh, 10 people come and look at, this one thing that this guy said was 10,000 years old and he brought it to the museum and these 10 people, they said, we want you to, to give us your opinion after looking at it for a second. Nine out of 10 people said it's not real. They then gave them as much time as they wanted to research this. And then it turned out that eight out of 10 of them, the eight out of 10 reversed their opinion and said, no, it's real. Right. And after, after they did the real studies and they took whatever samples and did things, they found out it was fake. But the idea that they nine out of 10 of these people had this immediate intuitive repulsion where they just said, it just feels wrong, right? So I started using that concept. And I'd had a couple of times at poker where uh, I felt sick when a card hit or I felt sick, like literally like almost like a sick in my stomach when something happened at the table a card hit 
or uh, a guy threw a bet out when he wasn't, I wasn't expecting him to bet. Most of the time it was a card hit. And uh, I had decent hands and I still ended up calling them uh, after I had this immediate intuitive repulsion, right? And so I ended up losing and I go, I'm, every time I have that, I'm not going to do that. Playing at the World Series, Greg Raymer's at my table. Um, the flop is like ace, queen, seven. He raised pretty flop and I called. I just called with two queens for some reason. The flop came ace, queen, seven, and he bet out. And I think I raised and he re-raised me. And I like go, oh, wow, I just had kept sick. And I threw away, you know, a flop to set and I threw it away. He's like, how the fuck can you do that? And I go, I just, I felt, you know, I didn't say this, but I'm like, I felt sick to my stomach. Yeah. And he turned over a set of aces. And I'd, I'd done that several times where uh, I have had this, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a feeling that I can't describe or understand why it happens but it's that same same kind of immediate intuitive repulsion that, you know, listen, I, I listen to that stuff. I, I've had enough experiences where I had, didn't listen to it and it cost me money. And so I just, I, uh, people would get so mad at me for, you can't fold that hand. You're like, <laughs> there's only one hand that beats you. How could you possibly do that? I'm like, I don't care anymore. I'm going to listen to that to that that when i get sick physically sick i'm going to listen to that so yeah um to me I don't know what. to me it's like there's this there's an intuitive intelligence or an intelligence that's subconscious that's beneath conscious thought and is kind of bubbling beneath the surface and sometimes it just bubbles up and you feel it and you cannot describe it or explain it but you feel it nonetheless um i mentioned this in another podcast recently too that took me down this weird rabbit hole of uh, chicken sexers. And in Japan, there's an occupation that is a chicken sexer. And the way that they train folks to tell the sex of a baby chick, right? Because they look very similar, right? But there's a, this need to separate the males from the females. Um, yeah. The training is done through intuition only, where the person who's doing it just says, you know, these are males, these are females, right? They can't describe why or how they know. And they train people mm -hmm. by just going through it over and over and over again. And the people eventually get this intuitive sense and they can tell between a male and a female without being actually able to describe how they know yeah. or why they know. They just know, um, right. which is quite uh, both – uh, reassuring and quite bizarre at the same time, but it, it's just cool information as it relates to like the power of our subconscious and the power of our intuition. We will find out one day, when one day, dead, one day when we're dead or one day when they finally figure this out. Um, you know, dogs do this all the time, you know, they can, they literally know, you know, whether a person is a bad person or a good person, they, they, they feel it. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and I believe we do too, uh, we just don't know how, and one day we'll, one day we'll know how, uh, and we'll be able to tap into that, I believe. But right now, that's why I believe that's why I do what I do. Sometimes I make plays that people, I folded two Kings pretty flop when people told me I was an absolute, I had, <laughs> I was playing with David Baker. He raised, uh, it was in a, in an event and he raised pre flop. And it was like, we were playing pot limit and he just, it min raised, right? And I literally felt sick to my stomach, felt sick to my stomach. And uh, he had two aces and I had two kings. And I, I literally, you know, it was at a time when I'm, I, my, you know, I'm hung out with all these guys that they're just, it's, everything's about math. And, you know, um, and I called because I didn't want to get yelled at by my friend, you know, <laughs> you know, like I raised and I, I raised cause I knew I should. And, and I, I called knowing I was beat, but I like, I didn't want to get yelled at by my friends when I told them I folded two Kings pre flop. So anyway, uh, the, the interesting thing is that if your opponent only has aces, the math still checks out a, a folding Kings, right? That the math still checks out. Yeah. If you, know that that's what they have um right. the difficult part is in knowing with certainty or trusting you know that yeah. gut instinct that that is all that they have or exactly what they have right and i think that like there there is an important sort of there, there's an important caveat for the listener here and that's that you need to be operating at an exceptionally high level to 
to yeah. trust that intuition because it's based on a lot of things. It's based on a lot of knowledge, a lot of data points that you've considered, a lot of yeah. the hours you've you've spent playing with a specific human being and even uh, picking up on like nonverbal cues. All these things sort of lead you down this road of like, okay, this is what they have, um, even if you can't describe it. So yeah, just want to uh, be that's careful. To the that's listener. a good point. Yeah. I don't do that. You know, I, that stuff does it. It, don't, it doesn't happen all the time, but when it happens, I like literally know. I know. And I don't know how I know. But another thing that was interesting. Uh, so when I, uh, in 2013, um, I won two bracelets. And when there were like 15 or 18 people left, I told my wife, Julie, at the time, I'm not the kind of guy that goes, I'm going to win this and I'm going to, you know, like, I don't like try to pump myself up. I went to her and I said, I'm winning. Like, this is weird, but I know that I've already won this tournament. Like literally knew that I won the tournament. And I did that both times and I didn't do it on any other tournaments. I cashed in seven events that year. The other events, I didn't say I'm going to win, but the two events I won, there were like 15, 18 people left and I go, this is really bizarre. I've already won this tournament. Like I, all I have to do is go through the process. And um, uh, she's like, why do you say that? I go, I, I just know. I just know I'm, I'm winning the tournament. Like it wasn't a, like a bragging thing. It was like just a, it's weird. I know I'm winning. Yeah. <laughs> so, you saw so, through, saw through won, the simulation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just bizarre. Like, I don't, I don't know how, how that happened, but you know, I, I didn't say it when I was, you know, deep in the other events. I didn't say that. I, I just knew it's just weird, but um, I, yeah, there's a lot to this and it's, there's so much to, to this, what we, what we uh, don't know, you know so much. Yeah. But it's fun to explore it. It, it is for sure. And uh, a friend of mine, Olympic gold medalist, um, Adam Creek uh, likes to say that uh, the body has intelligence that the brain doesn't know um, and speaks to that a lot. You know, when you, you think about somebody and then your phone rings or you're in a mm -hmm. coffee shop and you, you know, somebody's staring at you and you look up and somebody's like staring at you. These, these types of like yeah. very subtle things that you, we do regularly um, and don't really give much thought to, but like something's happening there, you know? Right. Right. I agree. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're at the hour 30 mark. Um, let's just do a couple of lightning round questions, man. And then we'll wrap up. You can okay. go about the rest of your Saturday. All um, right, let's do it. If you could gift all poker players, one book to read, what would it be? And why doesn't have to be about poker, by the way. Yeah. You know, I enjoyed reading, uh, I enjoyed reading the, the stories, right? So there was a book that I think Amarillo Slim wrote and it wasn't so much about, but it was about the, the, the stories uh, that where it, it opened my eyes to how people could have an edge on you and you don't know it. For instance, Amarillo Slim wrote about how there was this guy that beat him at ping pong, you know, they would, he would, lose you know 21 to 12 or 13 all the time and so the guy so amarillo slim uh decides that he wants to beat the guy and he says i'll tell you what i'll bet you five thousand dollars come over next week i'll 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 have two paddles you can pick which paddle you want first and we're going to play for five thousand the guy says you got it right so amarillo slim had been already practicing for a month uh with frying pans playing ping pong and, um, you know, the idea that the idea that there's some great stories about Titanic Thompson in the in that book, and it's just the idea that people are a step ahead of you, I think, is really important when you think they're a step behind. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially if they're in the gambling world and they're 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 kind of the kind of kind of guy that tends to win at most things. That's the guy that you got to watch out for. Right. And so it just. I enjoyed the, the, those stories because it talked about a lot of different stories. And, and uh, I, I just, I, I, I read that book and I, I love it as well. Um, it's Am Amarillo Slim in a world full of fat people. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I haven't read it, in, but I remember some stories and they're great stories to tell. 
you know, I tell business people those stories and uh, they just really get a kick out of out, out of it. And I was a, a, at the time, you know, I'd watch Amarillo Slim on Johnny Carson. And that's really one of the reasons I'm like, that guy's like cagey. Like he seems dumb, but he's cagey, you know, and I always, always liked his persona. Yeah. Most of the time when you don't have an edge, you think you do have an edge, especially if you're like skilled in something and you're like, when you're like convinced that you have an edge against somebody and yeah, that's when the bottom's about to fall out. <laughs> yeah, if they're, yeah. if they're uh, you know, a clever individual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you could uh, wave a magic wand and change one thing about poker, what would you change? I'd probably do two. Um, that's just greedy, Tom. I know I'm <laughs> greedy, but there's, there's, there's a lot of things that would change. Uh, I would, I would make it easier to kick people out of, out of, uh, games, you know, people that are, are, are being dicks and, you know, granted, I know they're good for the game, but I, it just, it ruins the environment. I think for, for business, you know, business people that just want to go out, most business people don't want to go out and see like people being dicks and treating them bad. And, you know, I, I would do that. I would also change the, like I stopped playing no limit hold'em uh, tournaments because of the speed of play. I'm a, I'm a mixed game player typically, but the speed of play is just, it, it's brutal. Yeah. I don't brutal. play tournaments and especially not live tournaments. Like there's just no chance I'm like waiting to play 30 minutes a hand or just like, just, it, it's just, it's it's almost obscene like it, it just it hurts me because like it's in cash painful. in cash you're you're incentivized to play fast right in tournaments you're incentivized to play slow and somehow yeah. the tournament operators have got to figure out how to disincentivize yeah. stalling because it is horrendous like there's no way that you should benefit from taking three minutes a hand like how is that a thing we got to figure this out yeah yeah it's it's brutal i stopped playing uh no limit tournaments because of it. I, I, I played in this event. Uh, it was a freeze out uh, and I won my first table and I got to the second table. I get there like two minutes late. There's 10 people at the table. There's no room. And so I say, Hey, everybody, can you scoot over? And they scoot over and they really let go like that, you know, like <laughs> that. Like, and so now I'm sitting like this and Doc Sands is at my table. And this is when I don't know how he plays now, but he literally would sit and think for like 15 seconds when it was his turn, before he looked at his cards, he would sit like this and wait and count to like 10 or 15. And then he would go look at his cards and his hands would go like this. And he would, he would move like this slowly. And then when he looked at his cards, it was like this. He held them up for like five seconds, put them down. And then he took his hand like this. And then he set for, for like a minute. I, I timed it and it was three minutes. And it, you know, he, a lot of times he would muck his hand, right? And so I literally, after that, I said, I can't do it anymore. And what I blew it, because I came up with this thing after I, I got knocked out because I couldn't take it, right? So I came up with this thing. If somebody's going to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to tell them, listen, I'm going to ask everybody, you think you're the best player here, right? You know, I'm going to ask everybody, I timed you, you took three minutes. So I'm going to ask everybody to take three minutes and we'll see a flop in a half an hour. So either you speed up play or we're all just going to, like, you'll have no chance of, of, of winning this tournament. You're going to take all of the skill out of it because now we're going to be at higher blinds and it's going to be all luck. Is that what you want? Like it really, like, you know, I imagine a guy makes a table, right? And he's from someplace and all he wants to do is play poker because he doesn't get to play in a lot of events and he's literally sucking the life out of the, out of the game. Like it, it pissed me off so bad. And uh, it, I, it's, it's terrible. I mean, it, it just is really, really, really bad. I don't even know that shot clocks are like the right solution because then guys are just taking like 60 seconds for, for everything. Uh, I mean, but right. it, it's just something it, it's gotta be. It, ruins the game. it ruined the game for me. It ruined the game for me. It really did. Like, listen, I no, I don't mind if somebody takes five minutes to make a decision or even 10 minutes if it's like their tournament life and they've been folding quickly and acting sure. quickly and all of a sudden they got to, you know, that's everyone should respect that. Right. But it's it's the it's the guy that does it when he has do seven and he sits there and looks at it. I, I literally just said, I'm not I'm not playing no limit hold him anymore. That's why I like, you know, mixed uh, limit games, because it like literally it's decision, decision, decision. 
I mean, you know, the better player is going to do better. To me, like ha- have somebody on the sidelines when when you call the floor on a guy, look at dude dude's hand from under the gun, and if it like doesn't meet a certain threshold, take five big blinds from him. I mean, just do yeah. something to punish them. Like, there's got to be a something. there's got to be something. a way. It's terrible. Yeah, I can't play the can't play the game anymore. Um. All right. So on that positive note, uh, <laughs> if you I could, hate uh, yeah. I hate it. Uh, if you could erect a billboard, every poker player has got to drive past on the way to the card room. What's it say? Uh, be nice to losers. I don't know, something like that. Be nice to the dealers and losers. You know, be nice. Like, <laughs> yeah, just but but like but driving away bad players because you're a dick to them. Like it just. I, I, I don't even understand. Like, you know, like sometimes it's a smart person. Like what, what is, what's going through your mind treating this guy who gives you money like shit? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Like it, oftentimes but, you know, I want poker to be fun. Oftentimes what's, what's more, what's funnier than that or, or more ironic is the person that is being mistreated is way more successful than the poker player who's doing the mistreating, you know, which exactly. is like, that. that's a yeah. funny irony. Is it like, for some reason, a poker player, because they are good at a, a card game, believe right. that they're superior to another human being in all facets of life. Like that's exactly, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. I agree uh, with that. Um, you working on any projects that are near and dear to your heart? We didn't even talk about your singing and songwriting at all, by the way, I just realized yeah. we, we got to an hour 40 in. I told you that that first question, it, it's quite a doozy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I write songs all the time. I haven't written as many in the last, uh, six months or so. Uh, but I, uh, I write and perform, do shows, uh, like, you know, in theaters and, uh, and do gigs at sometimes at a restaurant or a bar just cause there's something to do. Uh, but most of the time I like to do shows at a theater, uh, you know, like small theaters, 80, hundred people. And, um, you know, I, I'll play my songs, tell them why, why I wrote it and, and, uh, you know, have songs that make people cry, have songs that make people think and songs that make people laugh. You know, I have some pretty, I have a song called, uh, it's about getting your prostate exam, you know, called don't fear the finger. <laughs> uh, you know, so I have funny songs and I have songs about my daughters and songs about, you know, relationships and things like that. So, uh, but it's really, I started playing guitar at 52. And uh, I would say most people would say I'm a pretty decent guitar player. And uh, I've had some songs. Uh, I have co-written some, some, a bunch of songs with a, a friend of mine up in Canada who's, who's like an award-winning songwriter. We have a couple that made the top 10 in Canada. Uh, he, released, he released those up there and have a couple top 10 songs. And so it's cool. What is it about writing songs, singing um, that resonates with you so, so deeply, you know, you, you mentioned it, that it, it is your passion, right. For the, for the last yeah. 10 years. So h- yeah. how'd that happen? Um, it's kind of weird because when I was younger, all I did was play sports. So, uh, singing was for, uh, you know, non-athletes. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it that way. I could say it harsher than that. Uh, but I hate that. I thought that, right. And that's just, I'm just telling you how I thought when I was in high school, right. It was all about being a macho dude and all that. Uh, but so I never even sang till I was like in my thirties and I went to a karaoke and I didn't even want to do it. And I was like, what the fuck? You know, like you, you can, you sound just like Garth Brooks. Right. And so, um, then I didn't do anything with it. And then, uh, I was doing audio poker audio for a show that I was uh, like a, the color commentator on at this studio. And at the same time, I was the CFO for a company called Loudmouth Golf. John Daly wears their clothes on tour and I wore their clothes on TV when I play poker. And so the CEO, I said, you know, we ought to go on America's Got Talent. He had a good voice. The founder could play electric guitar and I go not to win, but just to play, just to have our clothes on, right? Just to market our clothes on mm-hmm. And so he goes, well, we got to have a song. And I go, well, I'll write a song. I'd never written a song <laughs> in my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm happened to be doing poker audio at this studio. And I go, hey, do you do music? He goes, 
that's what I do. I don't do poker audio for a living, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, he's got pianos thin, and guitars everywhere. Thin living everywhere. doing poker audio for yeah. a living. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a thin living, yeah. And so uh, anyway, so I wrote this song called The Most Fun You Can Have With Your Pants On, and I recorded it there. And I'm like, this is the most fun I've had in a long time. So I, I recorded pants or the no song. Pants or no pants. Yeah, exactly. And so I, the funny thing is I sent I sent this out to everybody in the company and they're going like, this is the greatest thing. Like, it's so cool. That's badass, you know, like, and the head of sales who I didn't care for at the time, uh, he was so negative. He goes, don't quit your day job. I'm like, Oh, perfect motivation. Right. <laughs> so when someone tells me I can't do something, I'm like, I'm going to, you know, especially if I like it, I'm going to, you know, do it as well as I possibly can. So, yeah, I, uh, so I wrote that song and I just started writing songs. Like they were coming out of me, like, like, uh, and I didn't even know I could do it. You know, I didn't even think about stuff like that. But, you know, I, I, I feel deeply, right? I wrote a song about Sandy Hook and the tragedy on my drive home from Vegas uh, when I heard about that story. And uh, it's called Just Another Day. And uh, it's about how parents, you know, when they wake up and they read the paper, or look at the emails and they eat breakfast with their kids, it's, it's just another day. And then they find out that it's not just another day. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, no, I've so I've written, uh, probably written and recorded probably 35, 40 songs. Um, and I'm just, uh, it's, I love it. I love it. And I, you know, it, I get really good reactions when I perform and, and uh, I do someone. So if you're friends with me, send me a friend request, anybody. Uh, I do Facebook lives. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm bored, I'll drink beer and, and then hang out with my friends on Facebook live and, and do that. So it's a lot of fun. I, it's, I love it. I wish I'd have done it, you know, when I was younger. Send me a, if you wouldn't mind, you know, send me, send me a song and we can, we can put I in will. the out, outro to, to this episode. I think that's a good okay. way, good way to close down the show. Um, yeah. and so Tom, f- final question here is, uh, if, where can the CPG listener learn more about you on the World Wide web? Um, if you well, want them to, um, if you don't want them to learn yeah. more about you, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy to, I, uh, you know, so I've written a book called, oops, I won, I, I, I won too much money winning wisdom from the boardroom to the poker table. And it's really about my life lessons. So you can learn stuff there. I have written a lot of articles for a magazine called Southwest poker news. I, I don't even know if those are, they're still out there, but most people, the, probably the biggest, one of the biggest compliments I got was, People say I don't read anything in there, but your your article, because it was usually pretty entertaining, and it was a, it was more about life and kind of seen through a poker player's eyes. And um, and then uh, you know I'm, my songs are on Spotify and uh, iTunes, and I need to upload a lot of my newer songs. But uh, yeah, I probably got 15, 20 songs uploaded on on there. Um, and um, but yeah, follow me on uh, Twitter. Donkey Bomber. I don't post as much as I used to, but I post a lot of stuff on Facebook. I'm I'm very uh, politically uh, minded, and it's not not really about politics. I think uh, what's going on in the world it's more about good versus evil, and uh, so I post a lot of stuff about that as well. Man, it, it's been great having you on. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know you better and you know know your story. Um, let's run it back in, in a year or two, hopefully. You know the world yeah. will have uh, will be different <laughs> in a couple of years as it relates to just. I hope so. Logistically, being able to do things um, in that yeah. sense. I hope so. Yeah. Take care, man. So. It's been really nice. I appreciate it. Nice. It's nice spending time with you. Sitting here having coffee. What just walked by me Ponytail, ball cap, blue jeans You don't want to stand out Wearing a do not disturb sign Tells me it's not the right time To walk up to you and say hi So I'm thinking what now A pen and napkin's all I got Melanie in my head There ain't no stopping me now I'm on That thing you do to me You'll hear A record one day about a girl Who blew someone away And you know you won't have a clue That it's about you That someone you
everybody has me well, it's about you it's about you it's about you yeah you got a grown man somehow to stop what he's doing heart dropping right now and the only thing i'm thinking about is what i should do with a smile that took me away erased what i had booked up for the day inspired a song with the green eyed look a glance is all it took but it's all for the good and I won't be the same There ain't no stopping me now I'm on about rocking it down I want everybody to see that thing it's due to me It'll be a record one day about a girl Who blow someone away and you It's about you. It's about you. It's about you. 